Uh, we, so you don't have handouts, so you'll have to, I'm, I don't really like screens because I feel like they're distracting, um, but we're going to make do with what we've got this morning. Um, so let's begin, and we're going to say this prayer that is the collect, it's a collect from the great vigil of Easter, the Lord be with you. Together let us pray. Almighty God, you have placed in the skies the sign of your covenant with all living things. Grant that we, who are saved through water and the Spirit, may worthily offer to you our sacrifice of thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome back to the Catechumenate, or welcome if this is your first time with us. Uh, the Catechumenate is a, a program w in which we uh, learn about our faith, and uh, for some folks we prepare for uh, the rites of renewal, so holy baptism, hol uh, confirmation, um, renewal of baptismal vows, or reception into uh, the faith. We also, this is a good way for us to prepare for um, things like if you're child is being baptized, so uh, welcome to everyone who is here this morning. And today we're going to begin a several week conversation about covenants. Um, so covenants, uh, to understand what they are, I'm going to use an analogy, um, an analogy of putting two sheets of paper together. All right, uh, so imagine two sheets of paper and there are different ways to put those sheets together. Um, one way is through something called a contract. And the way in which we might think about those two sheets of paper being put together is a paper clip, a paper clip binding those two things together. So how well does that contract hold up? You can remove the paper clip, right? And you can uh, find your loopholes around uh, something that is a contract. Now, a covenant is not a contract. Um, and so if, if a contract were holding together those two pieces of paper, it would be somewhat of a flimsy connection. A covenant is also not a promise, uh, which we might make by, you know, uniting our pinky fingers or perhaps cutting our, uh, our, our hands open and shaking some sort of uh, ominous promise that way. But if we were to rely upon that two sheets of paper being put together, um, the promise would be a staple uniting those two sheets of paper. Uh, but a covenant is not like th that uh, promise either. Um, are there any Harry Potter fans out there? Not very bold in raising your hands, Harry Potter fans. Okay, so in, in the Half-Blood Prince, I'm going to give something away here, but in the Half-Blood, I mean, spoiler alert, you should have read these books like 20 years ago. Um, but the, in the Half-Blood Prince, Severus Snape makes an unbreakable promise with uh, Narcissa Malfoy on behalf of Draco Malfoy, if you remember that part of uh, either the movie or the books. Uh, so that's a pretty binding promise, uh, but a covenant is even more strongly connected than even a promise. Um, a covenant is different. In our analogy, a covenant would be like using super glue to unite two sheets of paper so that what happens to one sheet of paper happens to the other sheet of paper. Uh, now there's more to it, and we'll get to it. In, uh, in the context of Holy Scripture, covenants are usually made between two unequal parties. They're not equal. Um, instead, the superior entity, namely God, uh, in effect closes that power differential, that space between the two parties, and unites the two sides together. Now, we'll talk about covenants for the next few weeks, um, and we'll hear about the Mosaic covenant, but that's the simplest covenant that we hear in Holy Scripture. I shall be your God, and you shall be my people. Uh, now, the paper analogy is a good one, but there's an even better analogy uh, that we see within our uh, communion service. If you pay attention, when the, the, uh, the wine and the water are up on the table, you'll see that the priests will pour a little bit of water into the wine. And that's a, it's actually a work within our atrium as well, but it shows how the divinity of God 
and the humanity of God kind of intermingle right there in the in that single kind of flagon or that single um, little picture that we have there. So um, it's a really it's a really powerful symbol, and we'll get to that covenant much later. Uh, today we're gonna ex- we're gonna explore a very early covenant. Um, we're gonna we're gonna look at the Noahic covenant. That's a fun thing to say, right? Uh, it's pronounced sort of like Noahic, as in there's no way God is ever going to do that again. <laughs> yeah, that you shouldn't be laughing at that terrible joke, but some, <laughs> somehow y'all are. Um, it's a really bad dad clergy joke. I mean, that's like a very specific niche uh, genre of uh, comedy there. So to understand this covenant, we have to explore the story of Noah, but I bet you already know some of it from this uh, song that's up here. Uh, Are y'all familiar with this song, Rise and Shine and Give God the Glory? All right, so this is, this is some, pr- there's pretty sound theology in this song, all right? The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody, uh, and then uh, get those animals out of the muddy, muddy children of the Lord. So that's the first part of the story, right? And then the Lord said uh, to Noah, let's build, build me an archie, archie. Um, Lord said to Noah, build me an archie, archie, built it out of cypress, barky, barky, children of the Lord. Um, and if we continue onward, we see the animals that came in, they came in by twosies, twosies. The animals that came in by twosies, twosies. Elephants and kangaroosies, roosies, children of the Lord. All right, it rained and poured. Now, this is where it's a little bit challenging because scripture actually has two different numbers here, but the one that we've chosen is 40. There's also the number 150 days. So uh, just like Charles was talking about last week, these two creation stories don't quite match up exactly. Even the story of Noah and the flood has two different things going on at the same time. But it rained and poured for 40 daisies, daisies. Almost drove those animals crazies, crazies, children of the Lord. The sun came out and dried up the landy, landy. Uh, The sun came out and dried up the landy, landy. Everything was fine and dandy, dandy, children of the Lord. Now, there's an apocryphal sixth verse. The animals, they came out by threesies, threesies, but it was only 40 days. So the gestation period would not have been long enough um, for most of those animals. Uh, but it's a fun verse. Must have been those birds and beesies. So you already know a lot, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you already know so much about this story. Uh, y'all don't remember that one? That's the Episcopalian version. If you grew up in Baptist world, you probably didn't hear that sixth verse. <laughs> anyways, anyways, okay. Let's break down the story a little bit, and then we'll talk specifically about the covenant that follows uh, this story. It's a pretty gruesome story, all right? So God created humans, um, and we see those. We saw those two creation stories, and not a ton happened between um, the creation stories that we talked about last week and this week. But there was something very specific. There was the um, the the dispute uh, between Cain and Abel, um, and so God saw the wickedness of hum- uh, of humans. This is literally what Scripture tells us. Uh, God saw that the wickedness of humans was great, and in them, God saw that their heart were continually turning towards evil. Now, remember that first creation story that we heard last week, right? Was creation is good, 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 very good, right? Like, that's what we heard, and yet, in just a very little time, we see the the kind of fall of humanity that happens um, outside of that garden. Um, So God said, I will blot out from the earth the humans I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Said in my best narrator voice, this does not look good for humanity. But enter Noah, uh, whose name in Hebrew and actually in some other ancient Near East languages means rest or repose, something important about that. 
Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. How did Noah find favor? How did Noah find favor in God's sight? Well, it seemed like Noah was unlike everybody else that was walking around on earth. Um, God conversed with Noah, so Noah was at least open to having that conversation. And God said, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. It sounds pretty intense, but the whole creation, the whole Cain murdering Abel thing may have seemingly traumatized God. It's like God created a, these human beings, and then all of a sudden the human beings are turning on each other, which was not God's intent. Now God continued to talk with Noah, telling him to make an ark out of cypress bark. And what would be God's task in the genocide of humanity? Well, God said, for my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven and all flesh in which uh, is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Yikes. It's pretty intense, right? Is there a silver lining? Well, for Noah, there is. To Noah, God said, I will establish my covenant with you, which we'll get to in just a moment. But Genesis tells us Noah actually listened to God and did everything everything that God had asked of him. So fast forward, after the ark was constructed, the rain fell on the earth. Noah did as God commanded, bringing in his family along with two of every kind of animal. The rains continued for 40 days and nights. The waters increased all the way over the tops of the mountains. Everything on the earth that had breath uh, died. Everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. After 40 days of flooding, Noah opened the window to see that the rains had stopped, and he sent out a raven, which flew to and fro but never came back, which really didn't help Noah or his family at all. So then Noah sent out one of his doves, and at first it found no place to land, so it returned, but then after another seven days, the dove went out and brought back. Does anybody know what the dove brought back? Olive branch. Olive branch. So that's, we have two symbols right there, right? Two symbols that we identify with peace. We have a dove and an olive branch, which in this interesting way, like I, I don't know if I ever made the connection that those two symbols date back all the way here and have to do with not just a peace amongst humans, but a peace between God and us. So there's something remarkable there. There's more s symbols coming up. Um, so Noah sent the dove back out, and then it didn't return, signifying that it had found land and that this was the, the subsiding of the waters. At this point, God spoke to Noah, telling him to leave the ark, to bring all the creatures with him, um, you know, by threesies, threesies. Uh, and then God then blessed Noah and said to him, be fruit to him and his family, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And all of this gets us finally, finally to this covenant, this uh, super gluing of the two sheets of paper together. Uh, and so would someone be willing over here to read, if I can scroll down, would somebody be willing to read this passage from Genesis 8, or Genesis 9, excuse me, 8 through 17? Thank you. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you tent, after you tent, oh, sorry, <laughs> and with every living creature <laughs> that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, <laughs> and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me in the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of, of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thank you. Thanks for reading. Um, so we, s we see this covenant. What is the covenant? 
to me, it kind of, what, what did y'all say? Life. life. Yeah, it's almost like, um, you know, the Hippocratic Oath that medical workers take, right? The first part of that is do no harm. It's almost like that's the bit that God is promising here within this covenant, uh, which doesn't sound, you know, this story sounds so antithetical to at least my understanding of who God is. And so there's something, there's something happening here. Um, but we see, we see this no harm that God will no longer destroy. We see this fulfilled by the bow in the clouds, right? And it's almost like the disarmament of God. God is hanging up God's bow. Um, this story provided a way of explaining both a natural occurrence, right, when you see the rainbow, um, but it also explained an attribute of God, that God would no longer utilize violence, the violence of storms to destroy humanity. And in the Old Testament, and particularly in Genesis, we get these explanations of why something is the way that it is. Um, why do we as humans not like snakes? We'll just go back to that, you know, second creation story. We don't, we, there will be enmity between us and the serpent. Uh, how come childbirth is rough? Well, if you follow the, you know, story of Adam and Eve, that's what ends up happening as a punishment to humanity. What's with a rainbow? We'll see this story. These explanations, though, also tell us something of how humanity was viewing God during those days, uh, more than necessarily who God is or was. So there were multiple, multiple na ancient Near East uh, societies that have a similar story to this flood story. To explain why such an event occurred, uh, it would have made sense to blame God or the gods. However, God was and is and always will be merciful, loving, forgiving. We as people of faith who trace our spiritual lineage all the way back through the Hebrew people, well, we've continually struggled with what, ha uh, what do we do when bad things happen? And particularly, what do we do when bad things happen to good people? Um, so this is kind of one of those first explanations there. Um, the pattern is when bad things happen, we think that God is mad at us, right? I think that we still instinctively have to fight that. Um, it's like how children will believe they did something wrong when their parents are upset. It's like they can see that something is wrong, and so um, even if there's no correlation, even if they didn't do something to make their parents mad, if their parents are mad, they may think, what did I do to mess something up? That there's something here happening too. Um, and yet, here are spiritual forebears yearning to describe why God would no longer annihilate almost all of creation. So this is the importance of the covenant. It signifies the disarmament of God, and as Christian people, it also alludes to the way in which we together enter the fullness of life. So I want to make a connection here, and it's kind of a leap, but what element is overwhelmingly present in this story? It's pretty easy. What element? Water, right? Okay. So what what does that connect to in our tradition? There we go. Baptism. Yes. So there's this easy connection, right? Water uh, is this abundant source of life, and yet when we baptize someone here at All Saints, what do we usually do? Do we? It's usually at infant baptism. Uh, do we do we have a big pool up front? No, right? We use like the sprinkling of water. Now, uh, Lionel Mitchell, who's a liturgical theologian, asserts in a book called Prayer Shapes Believing that the number of Episcopal churches which actually baptize by immersion is probably really small. But the prayer book has always named immersion as actually the first choice of how we will invite someone into the new faith. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful to see somebody that's actually undergoing that. Uh, now, we do not accept the position of those who contend that full immersion in water is necessary for baptism, but immersion certainly enhances the symbolism of the water 
and, and it makes it much clearer what's actually happening. And what is happening? Mitchell says, we go down into the water and we are buried with Christ and we come up out of the water and are raised to newness of life in him. Uh, so Paul, in his letter to the Romans, um, says uh, in um, a couple of verses, do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also walk in newness of life. So um, Frederick Buechner, who has recently gone on into the fullness of God's glory, um, wrote this wonderful book called Wishful Thinking, A Seeker's ABC. And he writes on the subject of baptism in this way. Baptism consists of getting dunked in or sprinkled by water. Which technique is used matters about as much as whether you pray kneeling or standing on your head. Dunking is a better symbol, however. Going under symbolizes the end of everything about your life that is less than human. Coming up again symbolizes the beginning in you of something strange and new and hopeful. You can breathe again. So that, let me tie a bow on all of this. The Noahic, like no way it's ever going to happen again, no way it covenant here links us eternally with God, like sheets of paper that have been super glued together. What happens to one happens to the other. In this covenant, God has said, I will no longer harm this creation, the other sheet, for what happens to one happens to the other. And the flood provides us with an image of newness of life that foreshadows what happens to us in holy baptism. We are buried with Christ as the flood overwhelms our old life, and we are resurrected out of the waters into the life of Christ. <laughs>